Thank you very much for coming. So obviously we have a very special guest with us today. Um, this is definitely the biggest turnout we've had for Tim Politics Society. So thank you everyone for coming and Christian, thanks so much for joining us. Um, there'll be time for a lot of questions at the end. So Christian's going to uh, speak for about 10-ish ten, minutes and then we'll open the floor to questions. So please raise your hands at the end. But yeah, Christian, when you're ready. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. So I haven't done a speech because I wasn't sure what you were going to be interested in. Because um, some of you will be interested in journalism and television and careers in the media. Some of you will be interested in politics. Some of you might want to talk about the war um, and Ukraine or anything else. So what I thought we'd do is I'll just, I'll just tell you a little bit about what I do and the way Channel 4 News works. Um, and find out a little bit about what you watch. And then let's just sort of throw it open and see what you want to talk about and what you want to ask me. Because I can, I can wang on about pretty much anything. Um, but I didn't want to talk about the wrong subject or the things that you're not particularly into at the moment. I mean, first of all, it's great that so many of you have come here to hear me tell you all about Jasmine uh, and, her, <laughs> and her baby years, um, or, or Jam Jar, as we like to call her at home. Um, but but uh, having, having got the embarrassment out of the way, um, look, the first thing is, because... When, when I was at your end, I mean, basically, I started my career shortly after leaving school. I got my first job when I was 18, presenting a series on BBC Two. So you may all be here thinking, careers are years and years away. Um, I don't really need to be thinking about this. But, you know, things can sort of fall into all that when you're least expecting. Um, and as I say, I got my first job really out of work experience. I had written to the BBC in Scotland. Uh, and asked for some work experience because when I was at school I had appeared on a couple of TV shows made in, in BBC Scotland um, which, were, which was a discussion programme. It used to invite an audience about this size and about this age to grill a public figure or a politician. It was a programme called Open to Question and, um, and I was on that, in, in that audience. So I kind of was vaguely familiar with the BBC because I'd been up uh, to be in this show a couple of times. And I got into that because I was a school debater. Um, and I did a competition organised by the Observer newspaper and they used to recruit for the TV audience from that competition. So I wrote to the BBC, got two weeks' work experience, and at the end of the two weeks' work experience, the head of that department took me aside and said, well, actually, we'd like to talk to you because we're looking for a new presenter for that show. And we were thinking, would you be interested? Would you like to do a screen test? So I went into the studio, did a screen test, and they offered me the job. So that was a week before my A-level results came out. Um, I was suddenly a BBC television presenter with my own show. Um, so things can happen in very, very strange ways. The media is not a structured um, industry. There are no conventional ways in or out. Um, things happen you know, for all sorts of different reasons. Basically, people get experience, they push their luck, they apply for jobs, and they get in one way or another. We still, on Channel 4 News, hire you know, occasional students who will write into us with a story idea uh, and say, well, how about this as a story to do on the news? They turn out to be brilliant and very clever and full of initiative, and we give them jobs and they stay. Um, and, 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 you know, there are training schemes and there are um, journalism courses that you can do as postgraduates. So you'll do an undergraduate degree and then a journalism diploma after that, at things like the City University in London or the Cardiff School of Journalism. But... To be honest, relatively few of us have done those sorts of formal you know, qualifications. Most of us have learnt on the job. Um, right now, I'm getting ready to go to Ukraine. I'm travelling tomorrow, uh, and I'll be in Lviv, hopefully doing the news on Sunday night. Um, so my job is incredibly varied. It, it spans British politics, um, things like the cost of living crisis, social affairs, looking into education, and... Um, poverty and, uh, and, you know, all the sort of social issues that we discuss on the news, but quite a lot of foreign affairs as well. It's so quite a lot of sort of foreign affairs uh, politics uh, and then just sort of storytelling. So I do a show called Unreported World, which is a half-hour documentary series in which we go off and we do stories that don't tend to make the news. They're slightly off the agenda and we sort of delve into them and spend a couple of weeks trying to find out a little bit more about a single subject. Um, I've just done one about the fentanyl crisis in America. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid drug. It's a painkiller, basically. 
huge addiction problems in America um, because of it, and it causes um, death very, very easily by overdose. So there's a massive overdose problem in America around fentanyl at the moment. More people in St. Louis, where we filmed this program, are dying from fentanyl overdoses than from COVID at the moment. Um, is that bad. So, so my, my job is incredibly varied, but my day um, begins at about 9.30. We have an editorial meeting for about half an hour in which everybody takes part. It's, it used to be in person, um, you know, in a room about half the size of this. These days we do it on Zoom, but everybody chips in and says, I think we should do this, I think we should do that. This is the most interesting story today. And then we, we work out, well, who do we want to interview? Who do we want to talk, you know, talk to? And then we embark on our day. Um, we have another meeting at about 2.15 to work out how everything's going. Um, and then we sort of hone the programme down a little bit more. And then at about 5 o'clock, 5.30, we try to finalise the order of where the stories are going, what's going to be the lead, what are going to be the headlines. And then I start writing the headlines around sort of 5.30, 6 o'clock. Um, and I will just write the top of the show on the whole, sort of the, the bit that you hear at the beginning, the good evening, and maybe the first intro. And then I will tweak some of the other intros that I'm reading. But most of my day is spent preparing, reading, um, talking to people about the stories that are in the news that day to try and find out what are the right questions to ask. Because our role on the news is sort of, it's quite simple in a way, in that it's to tell you what happened today um, and what we think is going to happen in the future. But it's also to try and analyse what's going on, to discuss it, to talk about different ideas in the news, and also, crucially, to hold power to account. And what does that mean? It means, it means looking at politicians or other people in power, whether they're in business or in education or other power structures, look at what they promised to do, look at what the problems are facing them and all, all the people who are clients of their services or citizens of their countries, and say, are they living up to what they promised to do? And if they're not, why not? And ask them the hard questions. Ask them the questions that people at home are sitting there thinking when they're looking at a politician who promised to do X, Y, and Z and hasn't done it, people at home are going, well, why didn't he? You know, why are you doing that? Why are people in Calais at the moment still queuing up to get into Britain when they are refugees who've lost everything? All those sorts of questions that people are sort of talking about at home or um, in, uh, in the cafes and pubs and, uh, and anywhere that people gather, those are the sorts of questions I've got to ask as well as a journalist because my main role is to be your representative. The main difference between what I do on the television or what other, my colleagues do on the radio and what you might see or hear in newspapers or newspaper websites or other unregulated websites is that broadcast television and radio is regulated by law um, and has to live up to a set of rules. The most important rule is that we have to be duly impartial. So we have to be fair to all sides of an argument um, we have to be fair to different political parties. We have to look at different sides of an argument uh, and talk, particularly in an election time, uh, when people are having to choose who to vote for. We can't just talk to the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. We have to talk to all the parties who are standing in a particular area. If you go into a local lo location report about one constituency in Kingston, you have to talk to all the people who are significant candidates in Kingston. And we basically have a duty to leave our own personal biases at the door. We've all got opinions about things. You might ask me what I think about Boris Johnson or anything else. Of course I've got opinions about all of that stuff, but I don't reveal them. Um, and I try to put them aside when I'm at work, because it's my job to be fair to everybody. In newspapers, or in a lot of the websites that you might be watching, or news services that basically just exist on social media, um, they can do whatever they want. They can be as biased as they want. They have, there are no rules around what they do. There are no laws. Um, and what that means is it's quite difficult, I think, these days to work out what are trusted news brands. Um, when I was coming into television or when I was your age, it was dead easy. There were only four television channels. Um, so television news was watched, was watched by everybody. Television news readers were the most trusted people in Britain or you know, in the sort of top few of the most trusted people in Britain because everybody used to turn on their TV at six o'clock, whenever it was, and listen to this voice of God telling them what happened today. Um, of course, those times have changed. Most of you probably don't really watch the news on television that much. Or, well, well I, I meant to sort of find out that. 
How many of you here do watch the news on TV regularly? And how many of you watch Channel 4 News? Okay, a reasonable number. How many of you really get most of your news from your mobile phone um, or social media? So, so, so the vast majority of you now are getting the news in very, very different ways. Um, can I just ask, just shout out, sort of, which apps do you tend to get your news from? Guardian Times. Guardian Times. BBC. BBC. Okay, fine. Within that, do you use the apps of those brands, or do you see what their news is on things like Apple News or other sort of aggregator sites that we talk about, where they bring lots of different brands? Uh, social media. Social media, yeah. So what we're finding is, you know, our, our content on Channel 4 News tends to be much more watched by your age group um, on TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And what we've seen in the last few weeks with the Ukraine war is that there's been a massive explosion in interest in the news in young people. So our young audience, which by which I've been 16 to 24, has more than doubled on Channel 4 News. Um, and our, our social media stats have sort of gone through the roof. So Channel 4 News, television is measured in different ways. There are about a thousand boxes in televisions around the country. And every time somebody turns on the telly in that house, it measures how long they're, what they're watching and how long they're watching for. That gets extrapolated out into, into national audience figures. And so every morning I get an email saying how many people watched Channel 4 News last night. It's a bit of a guess, but it, it gives us a rough estimate that on a boring day, it might be 600,000. On a really interesting day where there's loads of news going on and people are really curious, it might be double that, 1.2 million. That is a snapshot of who's watching at any one point in time. Over the course of that program, there might have actually been five or six million people who tuned in for a few minutes to see what's happening. What we're noticing at the moment is we might get 800,000 viewers on for Channel 4 News on the TV, but then two million, three million people are watching the program again on YouTube and we're getting millions of views on other apps because we, we cut up our content and turn it into other things. So, I mean, that's a sort of a, a rough overview of what we do. Um, in news terms, I would say, obviously, what I'm talking to you about today, or what, what I'd like to talk about today, vastly different to what the case would have been three or four weeks ago. Because the beginning of this year has obviously been gripped by a political crisis over party gates. Uh, and whether Boris Johnson was going to survive. You know, loads of demands for him to resign, not just from the opposition and in the media, but from his own party. Um, and his position was looking very precarious a month ago. Lots of people were assuming there was no way that he would be able to survive for very long. And the question was not about, will he make it through to the next election? It was, when will he go? Will he have to go immediately? Will he make it through to the end of the year while the party works out who they're going to replace him with? Or will they take it through to just before the next election and then replace him with Rishi Sunak, was the assumption, um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. All of that has changed in truth now because of the war in Ukraine. Um, and we saw yesterday one of the first MPs to call for Boris Johnson to resign from his own side, Douglas Ross, who's the leader of the Conservatives in Scotland, withdrew his demand for Boris Johnson to resign. I think we're going to see quite a lot of that. Um, and people will not the people who would have demanded Boris Johnson resigns as soon as we find out what's going on with all the fixed penalty notices for people who broke the law um, I don't think they will now because we're in the middle of this war situation and so the game has changed quite dramatically and even the people we'll be talking about as possible successors are also changing so Ben Wallace the defence secretary is suddenly being talked about in a lot of places as a much more likely successor than Rishi Sunak, partly because, you know, he's, he's handled a couple of crises quite well, uh, personally. I mean, Afghanistan was obviously a mess in terms of the withdrawal from Afghanistan, but Ben Wallace got quite a lot of credit for the way he handled it within his own party, and, and also within some people in the opposition. And then this process here uh, that we're going through with Ukraine, he's been instrumental in getting weapons out to the Ukrainians and doing it quite quickly and before the war kicked off. So lots of people are suddenly whispering and saying, oh, well, you know, not sure about Rishi. 
maybe Ben Wallace is the future. So politics changes very, very quickly. And all the guesses, you know, if I'd done a talk, as I probably did in February, and somebody said, do you think the Prime Minister will make it through to the end of the year? I'd have said, well, truth is, we don't know, we're all guessing, but if I had to bet, I would probably say no. Ask me that same question now, I'm really not sure. So, so first of all, the, the first lesson of that is predictions, particularly predictions you see in the media, are mostly rubbish. Uh, they're just kind of guesswork chats based on what we know at that moment in time, and the news changes very, very dramatically. Um, and, um, and, and, and B, you know, sort of the lessons often, your estimates, your guesses from what you're watching are often as good as the experts. So I'll stop there um, just to sort of see what you would most like to talk about, because some of you might want to talk about anything from Bake Off to the war in Ukraine. Who wants to kick off? Yeah. In terms of sort of related to having quite extreme, people with quite extreme views on television, I've seen, say, Nick Griffin got quite a lot of airtime from the BBC. Yeah. Do you believe um, that, that we should restrict who we put our, uh, on television, like those individuals, or should they be given airtime because maybe people um, have a bit of, like, maybe they do have a bit of support from the population? Well, the reason Nick Griffin, who, if you don't know who Nick Griffin what, is, he was the leader of the British National Party. Um, very controversial figure in politics, obviously, accused of racism, um, and had some pretty uh, controversial policies like repatriating people, as he saw it, from, um, or sending, sending people home was basically the shorthand uh, in, in BNP terms, um, even though their home was often Birmingham or Kingston, um, because they might have been born here, and their parents might well have been born here, but in BNP terms they were seen as immigrants. Um, the reason he, were, he, he was getting quite a lot of attention at one point in time was because the BNP were getting a lot of votes. Um, and, you know, the, the law says, it's very simple, you know, that if, if, if you are a serious democratic force, which the BNP was, they were getting councillors elected, and they even had, I think, two members of the European Parliament um, elected, um, they have to be covered by the news. And so you have to have them on, you have to give them airtime, and our job as journalists is to hold them to account, to challenge them, to put the other side of the view um, to them and, and, and try and do it sort of fairly and accurately and make sure that they're not able to mislead. Uh, and we have those same issues with all sorts of people in politics all the time. You know, Nick Griffin is kind of a person from history now. You, I don't think you're going to see him on the telly very much. But, you know, we've had all, the, all of those issues with uh, UKIP and its difference... Um, guys is over the years and Nigel Farage and Tommy Robinson who's a sort of, I suppose, the spiritual successor of, um, of Nick Griffin uh, in terms of sort of far-right British politics. Um, you know, you sort of, you stray into cancel culture a little bit. You know, if, you're, if you run a magazine or a website or a newspaper, you're entitled, you're, you're entitled to decide who you put in it. And you might well say, I'm not having them in, or I'm not having a communist in, or, you know, I, I will decide who's in my publication. And some people will be beyond the pale. As far as broadcast news is concerned, we have to be fair according to what the British public are thinking at the moment. And if a proportion of the British public like extremists, we have to cover them. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier how the war in Ukraine has sort of overshadowed um, big issues in this country and perhaps taken um, focus off of politicians. Um, do you think that it's possible for the media or for perhaps the public at large to focus on more than one pressing issue at a time? Well, it's really interesting, and I think things have changed slightly um, recently. In that We were just talking about this because I'm going to Ukraine, and I was thinking, well, at the moment, since the war started, the news has basically been nothing but Ukraine. Maybe one or two other stories. Uh, and only that in the last couple of days. And we were kind of wondering, well, how long can this carry on? How long before we start covering other news? Um, and I think maybe things have shifted a little bit over the last couple of years because of the pandemic. Because during so, during so much of the pandemic, COVID occupied so much space in the news that we've kind of got used to having almost single subject news programmes looking at different aspects of one particular thing. Um, so I think maybe tastes have changed, but I mean, it's, it's hard to say how long this particular period will go through, but it's quite unusual. 
you know, it's quite unusual to have this kind of period of time. Um, and I would guess we've got another week or two um, of this kind of saturation coverage. And then we'll start introducing more stories. It also depends whether you get another really dramatic story. So if something massive happens in Britain that, that forces its way on, then it will be covered. And, uh, and, you know, and then we'll have to work out, well, is the, is the war still the lead or is... You know, ten people in Downing Street getting fixed penalty fines for going to parties the lead. You know, that's going to be a difficult day when that happens. Um, whenever we get told um, what the truth is about that, um, or anything else, you know, a disaster, a crash, you know, a terrorist attack, all those sorts of things are normally things that are without doubt the lead story, and you do a lot of them. Um, and it, it's really just down to sort of judgment. There's no right or wrong about these things. It's just kind of what feels right. Yeah. Do you think that mandatory impartiality is able to actually amplify the status quo you know, to such an extent that it's no longer just reflecting the views of the population, but it's, it is taking the perspective, which is just the what is, and then sort of almost influencing the public towards that. So do you think where the centre is in political ground is actually on itself a biased position? Which well, that's two different points you're making yeah, there. I, the I agree that the centre... It is not my job to be in the centre, sure. OK? So um, being equally hard to the left and the right does not, or, you know, does not solve my problem. I've also got to be hard to the people in the centre and ask them hard questions as well because the centre is obviously a position. Um, impartiality, if the suggestion is impartiality basically preserves the status quo, well, just think about British politics in the last few years. You know, do you think we've got the status quo? We've had, actually, we've had really dramatic political change in, in this country and in America, we've had, you know, the, through the whole Brexit referendum and, um, and, and the Conservative government and Trump in America, you know, we've had quite violent shifts in opinion um, that have been, you know, that, that have really rung the changes. So I think, no, I don't, I don't think broadcast impartiality, legal impartiality, preserves the status quo. Um, I think, uh, you know, you know, but... but you're right to raise the question of do we challenge everything enough? And I think sometimes we don't. I think sometimes it's temp there's a temptation. You quite often see journalists on TV saying, well, I get loads of complaints saying I'm, a, I'm biased to the left and loads of complaints saying I'm biased to the right. That must mean I'm getting it right. I don't think that's true. I think you can get complaints from the left and right because you're a centrist dad. Who, who gives both sides a hard time, who doesn't like Nigel Farage and doesn't like Jeremy Corbyn. That is a bias. Uh, it's a bias towards the centre, and so we've got to be careful about that. But, you know, it's, it's a good one to raise. Um, yeah, further back. What do you think of American news channels like Fox and CNN? Because stylistically, they're very different to British news. Yeah, I mean, well, I think Fox and CNN are quite different, although less different now than perhaps they were. CNN used to be, you know, or used to market itself originally as a impartial news channel in America. The birth of Trump meant that CNN in America did become what, you know, it's a quite, a quite anti-Trump news channel. And so it was seen as sort of left of center in the same way as MSNBC, which is the other big American news channel was. And Fox is obviously to the right and has been for a long time and, um, you know, is, is, is very staunchly there. Personally, I think they're a bad thing because I think they... You know, that kind of open bias in, in television news because it confuses. I think it confuses what we are all trying to do. If you have a news channel in this country, like GB News or something like that, that has much more of a sort of a political identity and it looks quite similar to what I'm doing or what the BBC are doing, we might make the mistake of thinking that they are all the same. They're not. And you've got to be a bit more discerning about what you're seeing on Fox News um, than what you might see on national public radio in America, which is, which is an impartial news service, because they just lie or get things wrong or don't know what they're talking about. And, you, you know, and, and there's no duty on them to try not to. Um, they can do whatever they want. So I, I hope we don't go that way in Britain. You know, is, is my, I mean, you know, I'm slightly fighting a losing battle because as media changes in this country, more and more people can start up a news channel, start up a internet service that looks a bit like a news channel. It's dead cheap now, isn't it? Just to stick a camera in front of a desk and put in a, a fake 
um, green screen set that looks like a news set. And, and lots of people do this um, and pretend that you're the news. Um, I, I, think, I think it's a slippery slope and it's a dangerous way to go. Uh, particularly at times like this, you know, when you're looking at the war, and, and this is an information war that we're looking at. So, you know, lots of you will have seen the pictures of the maternity hospital being bombed in Mariupol. Um, the Russians immediately said that was a fake. And they said that they were actors. And that the woman that you all saw who was pregnant, heavily pregnant, you know, was an Instagrammer who was making it all up. So, you know, you've got to somehow work out who's telling you the truth when you're watching these different news channels. If you watch that on RT, Russia Today television, you'd be hearing all about how the Ukrainians are waging an information war and they're faking all this stuff and uh, they're conning the West. Um, so I, I think there's a real value in having trusted news brands who you can say, I, I broadly believe what they are saying. Um, and I hope to continue in this country. Yeah, in the back. BBC hasn't told me if they're giving me my TV show in August, but assuming they don't, um, what would you recommend are like, the best activities at university and like first like jobs to target like give oneself the best chance? If you want to be on TV. Or like a job in like reporting and journalism. Um, well just to do it. I mean there is loads of student journalism uh, that you can do at university. You know, most universities have got uh, you know, more than one student newspaper, and they've got TV stations and radio stations as well. And you don't even need radio stations anymore. I think that's the point. You know, you can be your own, um, your own brand these days and just go off and do your own journalism. It's very easy. You can do it on a mobile phone. Um, and, it, and it is perfectly feasible to do it on a mobile phone. You know, I've had to sometimes. The last time I went into Syria to cover the war, my crew were refused entry to the country and I had to go in on my own. All I had was a mobile phone. And I did three nights of Channel 4 News on a mobile phone. So you don't need to, you know, you don't need big structures. You don't need TV stations. I just, my advice would be, if you're interested in journalism, make it on your phone. Put it on YouTube. Circulate it on social media. Tell your friends about it and see what happens. But also, obviously, try and get it into, into it for real by writing to TV stations and you know, broadcasters and all the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, do you think the rise of social media in news reporting has democratised access to news, or has it polarised the landscape of news reporting? Well, it, it, I mean, it, it could well do both, couldn't it? It's not an either or. Um, it's de you know, social media is definitely polarising because it enables people to organise around campaigns and to amplify things that in the past you might not have noticed. Um, but they, you know, yes, I, I think social media has democratised the spreading of information. Um, whether it's news or not, again, is debatable. Um, but, uh, but yes, you know, any, everyone is a journalist, you know. And again, if you look at what's coming out of the war, most of the pictures you're seeing coming out of the war are not shot by professional journalists. They're shot by ordinary people on their mobile phones. And then we have to try and check them. So now Channel 4 News in the office... We've got a whole load of people who are checking all that video before we put it out on the air. Because some of it is fake, some of it is old. You know, there's some video that gets recycled, that does the rounds on Twitter, and then, you know, after an hour or two of it, of it being, you know, amplified everywhere, someone goes, you know, that's actually from 2014. It's out of date, and we're recycling it. Or that burnt out hospital is not from Ukraine, it's from Chechnya. Um, so, you, we spend a lot of time trying to look at the images and try and compare them against Google Maps, satellite imagery, trying to get the metadata out of the pictures and the video to see if we can verify that it is what people are saying it is. And only then do we talk about it. Yeah. Um, I suppose I'd be quite interested to know how you're feeling about going to Ukraine. And kind of on that point, how do you feel that journalism as a career serves to separate professional life from personal life so would you say there's more pressure as a journalist to um, be that voice um, the public figure who's uh, reporting things would you say that's difficult to deal with um, I suppose you don't I mean it's a, it's a job in which you don't really separate personal life and professional life very much because you're always on 
because you're always trying to find out what's going on and you're always thinking about what's going on and you're always watching the news and when you watch the news you're not just watching as a viewer you're watching as a journalist um and yeah you know and and quite often if you're a journalist you you will find yourself somewhere where something happens and you find yourself on holiday i mean we go to australia every year because uh jasmine's mum's australian and a couple of years ago we landed in sydney literally landed in sydney and as we landed everyone turned their phones on the way you do you know when, the, when they say and they use the mobile phones and everyone's phones pinged because there had been a terrorist attack in sydney um, and, and a man had taken a load of hostages in a chocolate shop in um, in Sydney shopping centre, and of course that was the end of my holiday. Um, I had to sort of run to the hire car place, drive into town, and start doing the job. So it's hard to separate your work from um, from your private life, um, but you have to try and be a bit disciplined. And how am I feeling? I'm feeling fine about it. I mean, where I'm going is not currently dangerous, Lviv where a lot of the broadcasters are now basing themselves. But, you know, everyone was in Ky- Kiev, Kiev, uh, as it was. as it was. Um, most of the presenters have left that now because it looks like the Russians are going to, you know, encircle it. Um, and so a lot of the broadcasters are now basing themselves in Lviv, which is in the west. And it's it's a few hours away from where the fighting is happening. So it's, it's relatively small. If we move towards any of the more dangerous places, then it gets a bit more hairy. But um, we don't do that without, you don't just race off. You, 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 you look at what's going on, you do a lot of research, you try and find out where the safe roads, um, where the Russians are at the moment, where the Ukrainians are at the moment. You talk to other people who are in those areas before you go anywhere. Um, and, and we don't just decide to do it ourselves. You know, we kind of, first of all, we're in a team of three or four people minimum. Unless everybody is happy to go to a dangerous place, we don't go there. And we always ring London and say, this is what we're thinking of doing. And, you know, and, and this is where we're thinking of going. And they have the final say. We can't just sort of hair off. Um, because, you know, bad things happen. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, go on. Uh, uh, so, do you have an opinion on satirical uh, journalism and other, and other non-official uh, forms of journalism? It's a good thing. Well, <laughs> Or, you know, the, you know the, the, more, the more types of creative expression and political commentary and, um, and factual information getting out there and engaging people, the better. And if some people don't really want to what, read a normal newspaper, but they really like a satirical magazine like Private Eye, then great. Because you'll get a lot of information out of that too. Uh, yes? Do you think the potential privatisation of Channel 4 will have an effect on the kind of topics that are covered in... Do I think it will? No. I mean, it, it theoretically could. Um, and uh, privatisation of Channel 4 could, could change Channel 4, is the argument that Channel 4, the bosses of Channel 4 make, in that at the moment, Channel 4 is owned, but this will, stuff most of you don't, won't, won't have bothered to find out, but basically, you own Channel 4, it's a publicly owned asset but it's run commercially, so you don't pay for it. We are run as if we are a private company, so we sell advertising, and with that money that we make on advertising, we fund our output. We don't make a profit, so we don't make anybody rich uh, as a result. If we were privatised, we would have to make a profit because our owners would have shareholders who wanted a return on their substantial investment in having bought Channel 4. So, yes, the news and current affairs could change in that environment because... An owner might say, do we have to spend that much on that? You know, could we not spend something on programmes that are more profitable? Um, because Channel 4 News, while it's, a, it's an important programme on Channel 4, it doesn't get the biggest audiences on Channel 4. Things like Bake Off and uh, entertainment shows tend to get more, more viewers. So, yes, you know, th- those sorts of considerations could affect Channel 4. What the politicians say when you ask them this, what the government says when you, when, when you ask them this, is that, if they were to do it, they would ensure that the new owners of Channel 4 would not be allowed to do that. They would, they would introduce some new rules uh, to try and protect the news. Whether you can really do that, I, you know, is not clear. Um, and how long that would last, you know, when, when Sky News changed ownership from the Murdoch Empire to the American NBC Empire, Comcast, they had to promise, I think, to fund Sky News for 10 years to, to a particular amount of money 
and to give it editorial independence. So for 10 years, Sky News is safe, but I think we're already four years into that. What happens in six years' time? Anyone's guess. They could just turn it off and close it. Yeah. Um, how much um, of an influence does the government have on like private uh, news uh, outlets? And if so, does um, is Western news slightly biased by the government um, against I don't know, the, the Russian news? It depends what you mean by private news. If you mean newspapers, there are some newspapers. Daily Telegraph, very close to Boris Johnson, obviously. He used to work there. He's got big supporters there, uh, people like Charles Moore. Um, and they sort of announce stuff there, and they tend to be his cheerleaders. There are so so there, there will be newspapers who decide to back certain political figures, and they have close links with them. Um, in terms of television, um, I don't think you could say there's a huge influence. I mean, if anything, to be honest, privately owned stations, like ITV, it's very difficult for the government to influence ITV because ITV is privately owned. The go if a government minister rings up the head of ITV and says, I don't really like what you're doing on your news, they can just say, I don't really care what you think. You know, what's it got to do with you? It's much easier for the government to bully the BBC because the government decides how much money the BBC gets and whether the BBC has a future. Because the BBC is created by an act of parliament, it's a royal charter, and every few years the government decides how much money the BBC is going to get. And as you may have noticed, there's been a big debate recently because the BBC is facing massive cuts, and so BBC News is going to be cut. So, yes, there is obviously a pressure. If you if you are in the BBC, if a government you know spin doctor rings you up or a government minister rings you up and says, you know, we're not really happy about this. They will deny it and say, no, of course we don't give in to pressure. And I'm sure they try to stand up to pressure. But of course, that pressure is going to have some sort of effect on an organisation when you know that they're, they're determining how, you know, you, whether you have a future. So in a way, it's easier for the government to exert pressure on a state-owned or funded body than it is for them to exert pressure on a private body. But as it happens... Because the private bodies tend to be newspapers and they can be as biased as they want, that's where the relationship with the influence tends to be. Yeah. Um, why do you think the government refuses to go on Channel 4 News? Do you think that Boris is afraid of Gary Well, uh, I mean, they do. I mean, it's not the case that they don't come on Channel 4 News. It is the case that over the last few years, they've come on less. Um, and it's certainly, you know, when I started at Channel 4 News 24 years ago, it was routine that a government minister would be on, not every night, but sort of every other night. And we just expected, to, it was part of their job to come on programmes like ours and face hard questioning. Now there are so many different media outlets that the government can basically say, you know what, we don't actually have to do them because we can go on uh, outlets that are a bit easier to deal with. So if they are afraid of individuals, then yes, they might, they might avoid them. And there are some, there are bound to be some ministers who avoid Gary or me or who are, you know, whoever, because they're just kind of a bit nervous. But, but, it's, but having said that, you know, I've interviewed most of them um, over the last couple of years, including Boris Johnson, and they do come on. They just don't come on as much as they do the others. And I think the truth is, I mean, I, I've talked to people like Craig Oliver, who used to be David Cameron's spin doctor, because he used to work at Channel 4 News about it and he used to say things like what's in it for us you know we, we we have to spend hours preparing a minister for tough questioning um and and then there's quite a strong risk that you'll make them look stupid so you know so obviously they are a little wary of it uh yes in the middle there on the front row yeah oh thanks uh coming from uh interviewing like uh some famous I was just wondering, like, who, who's been your most enjoyable kind of celebrity to interview? Oh, God. Uh, I'm really bad at, you know, the most enjoyable, the one you like best, to be honest. I mean, I like a lot of them. I like most of them at the time. Um, and when people say, what's the one you're most proud of or whatever, it's usually the one I did last, because that's the one that's freshest in my, in my mind. I mean, I've been very lucky to invite, you know, to interview lots of my sort of, not heroes, but people who I really love over the years and um, 
Uh, I don't know. If you asked my son, he'd probably say KSI, which we did a couple of months ago. Uh, if you asked Jasmine, she'd probably say Lin Manuel Miranda, that we did a couple of, a couple of months ago. Um, so who, was, who would be my? I have no idea, to be honest. Um, I, I kind of enjoy intelligent celebrities or pop stars. I do a lot of pop, you know, musicians. Um, and I really like talking to musicians who engage with the world and want to talk about politics and the stuff that, that they're interested in as well. And they're really, really good fun. And they can be anyone from Damon Albarn from Blur and Gorillaz to somebody probably nobody in this room has heard of. But there used to be a band called The Smiths, who I was really into when I was your age. And um, Johnny Marr was the guitarist in The Smiths. And I'm a, I'm, I'm a big fan of Johnny Marr's guitar playing. And I've interviewed him a couple of times, and he's actually invited me to his studio in the next week or two, but I can't go to Ukraine, um, to go through all his guitars and to talk about how he wrote different songs on different guitars. That kind of thing to me is just like the most exciting opportunity in the world. Uh, sorry, who hasn't? Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry to break back. Yeah. You mentioned how like, oversaturation of certain music can kind of lead other ones to kind of go neglected. So with the like climate change supports, is it like is it kind of your responsibility as like journalists to bring these matters back into the public attention? Yes. And like why is that done more? Because I feel like Yeah. The question is is it our responsibility to put things like climate change in the public eye more? And yes it is. Um because it's our responsibility to tell people what we think is really important. And obviously climate change is massively important, huge threat to the world, uh, and we should be doing more. I think the blunt truth is that, um, and this is, not, this, is, this is not very flattering for the media, that in the run-up to COP26, all broadcast media and all news media did loads and loads of environmental coverage every day. And it wasn't saturation, but it was, it was everywhere. Uh, and then as soon as COP26 was over, we suddenly hit a massive political crisis and then a war. And the environment just kind of fell off the agenda. And so, yes, and we do keep having this conversation. Well, I had it yes, yesterday, in fact, you know, because we used to, we had a rule last year on Channel 4 News that we had to do an environmental story every day, even if it was just 15 seconds of something that had happened, that we would make an effort to do an environmental story every day. And that's kind of dropped, fallen by the wayside because of everything that's happened. So. It is our responsibility to say we've got to put that back on the agenda um, and uh, and do it more, but we haven't. It's, it's been a failure. I think we're out of time, aren't we? I, I love you know, very happy to go on, but um, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I speak too long for each each question. But if you have if you have specific questions, if any of you are interested in careers in the media or want to reach me um, with a particular question that you want answered, I'm very easy to get hold of. You can email me at krishnan at channel4.com channel for the number um, so if you send me that it's on my twitter um, which is chris gm you'll see the email address if so if you want to send me a particular question feel free to send me a question and i'll try and reply say you're from tiffin otherwise i might ignore it guys <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>